is up, humanoid nation? Today's video I'm reacting to is another wrestling channel. It is Cultaholic Wrestling. Great channel. Love what they do. This time I'm going to be reacting to 10 WCW losers who went on to become big stars. Right now we see Kane, formerly known as Bruiser Mastino. Completely forgot he was in WCW. We have Stunning Steve. Wait, he was, Stunning Steve Austin was a loser. He, he was a great TV champion. He had great matches. Uh, trying to think of some people, but I really can't. Vader went from WCW to WWE and became a loser there. Big old stinky bear. But okay, enough talking. Let's see uh, what WCW was losing. What, had WC Fuck me, I can't talk today. Let's see what WCW did and how they fucked up. All right, let's do this. World Championship Wrestling had a maligned reputation when it came to letting future stars slip through their fingers, whether it was Stunning Steve Austin. Big Again, Stunning Steve Austin wasn't a loser. He did great shit. Foley or, you know, all four radicals at the same time. While their talents were plain for all to see, there were other wrestlers who perhaps didn't seem like anything special at the time, but years later, sometimes many years later... Oh, mean Mark. One of the biggest losers back then. Went to WWE, became The Undertaker. A god. Later, became major players elsewhere. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are 10 WCW losers who became big stars. Join us. This video is brought to you by I, WrestleCrate. WrestleCrate. I tried this. The original to I'm sorry, but WrestleCrate is not great. I tried it once. Eh, Ryan Armstrong. O'Brien oh, Armstrong, the road dog. Brian Armstrong. Oh, you didn't, didn't know? know? Yes, ages before making it big in WWE as road dog, Brian Armstrong was trying to get his foot in the sports entertainment door, which included an off and on dalliance with. My God, this man looks 50 even when he's younger and younger. He always looks old. But that's the Armstrong DNA code for you. UCW. Brian's older brothers, Brad and Steve, were both working for the company at the time and must have put in a good word for their sibling. Given the Armstrong family's reputation as all being great workers, it's no surprise WCW gave young Brian an opportunity despite his inexperience. He first wrestled on a house show in 1990, where he put over Terry Taylor before coming back a few years later and showing up here, there, and everywhere, typically- Good lord. Terry okay. Taylor before coming back. It's so weird seeing Road Dog was just wearing trunks. No wonder he wears clothes. He needs a shirt in the pants because he does not have that body. He a <laughs> few years later and showing up here, there, and everywhere, typically in losing efforts on Saturday night, worldwide, main event, power hour, and pro. Realizing his WCW career was likely going nowhere fast, James signed with WWE in the 1994. Roomy. After initially struggling to properly establish himself, the DOGG caught fire in the Attitude Era as a member of D-Generation X. Interestingly, James tried to rejoin WCW after being fired by WWE, but showed up seeking employment on what turned out to be- <laughs> I can spell my name, Paperboy PhD, and getting rowdy. <laughs> Not the last ever Nitro. He probably should have called somebody first. Number nine, Mako Satamura. Along with using international talent to help establish their cruiserweight division in the mid 90s, Eric. I'm sorry, but who's Mako Satamura? I don't know much about Japanese wrestling, but he I'm going to learn today. Called... I'm so sorry. Just, I'm learning. Somebody first. Japanese wrestling. Number nine, Mako Satamura. Along with using international talent to help establish their cruiserweight division in the mid 90s, Eric Bischoff also looked overseas for female wrestlers in a bid to get a women's division going as well. To go along with Medusa and Luna, Easy E brought in several performers from Japan's Gaia promotion, including a fresh faced Mako Satamura. Mako did a bunch of matches for Worldwide and Pro against her contemporaries, including a first round match in a tournament to crown a WCW World Women's Champion, which was eventually won by Akira Hakotu. 
That wasn't the only tournament Satamora participated in during this US excursion, however, as she also showed up on an episode of Nitro in the semi-finals of the WCW Women's Cruiserweight title tournament. Post-WCW, Mako established herself as one of the very best workers in the business, and is justifiably considered a living legend these days as she reigns as NXT UK Women's Champion. Oh, her, okay, alright, that Mako, alright. My bad. My bad. Number 8, Terror Rising. Triple H. Terror Rising. One of the biggest... Ha, uh, ha. Uh. Yeah, WCW, he was a loser. He not going anywhere. Right now, look at him now. He's the, truly the king of kings. When you really think about it, Hunter Hearst Helmsley, or Triple H, is a bit of a daft moniker, isn't it? Triple H sounds like a type of cream you would buy to treat sunburn or something. Well, do you know what sounds a lot stupider than Hunter Hearst Helmsley? Terror Rising. That is the name Paul Levesque was saddled with during his early WCW days, where he battled and beat such luminaries as Keith Cole, Sonny Rogers, and T.A. McCoy. Ooh. In those days, the Cerebral Assassin was still figuring it all out and was basically a good head of hair in a tight pair of trunks and was some ways away from fully developing his game, so to speak. His opportunities increased when he became Jean-Paul Levesque and started speaking with a French accent. I love that. The worst French accent I ever heard. I am Jean-Paul Levesque. Uh. But that gimmick also screamed mid-carder for life. A prospective team with Lord Steve Regal as the original Blue Bloods had promise, but it was actually Regal who convinced Levesque that he needed to leave WCW and join WWE if he wanted to gain the requisite experience to get better at his craft. My boy, I need to leave this place. It's shit. There's no chance for me. You're, you're still good. Go to the greater pastures and make yourself something. Marry the boss's daughter and take over power years later when your father-in-law becomes a sexual deviant pervert. Aft. He did all right for himself in the end. Number seven, Bruiser Mastino. Hey! Jane Jacobs famously had to endure successive naff gimmicks in WWE before finding the one that launched him to worldwide fame and fortune. Isaac Yankum DDS and Fake Diesel were both painfully lame and would have probably finished off a lesser performer for good, but if history had gone differently, the mayor of Knox County could have found himself working for the competition. Jacobs turned up for a one-off appearance on WCW Saturday Night, a couple of years before becoming an evil dentist to wrestle Sting, and put him over, obviously. Dubbed Bruiser Mastino, a name first used by the man who played Mantar, Jacobs looked like... Actually, I don't know what he looked like. Some sort of throwback nightclub entertainer with his shiny gold vest, curly blonde hair, and... That looks like a gigolo. 90s gigolo. A depressed 90s gigolo? Uh, Hollywood smile? Greener than his opponent's tights, it must have been obvious to everyone watching that Bruiser needed a lot more seasoning. Luckily for him, he got it before undertaking his make-or-break role as the Big Red Machine. Number 6, Damon Stryker. Ooh. Damon Stryker, hard-boiled private investigator who plays by his own rules, or plucky Canadian upstart looking for his oh, big break Oh, it's Egg. I mean Edge. Inside joke was between me and some friends. We call him Egg. Hey, it's Egg. In the wrestling business. Adam Copeland was a lifelong WWE fan and had always hoped that he would sign a contract with Vince McMahon's organization, but it was WCW who provided him with his televised debut. Commuting an entire 24 hours from the Great White North to Disney MGM Studios in Orlando, Florida, Damon Stryker got to play bump dummy for Kevin Sullivan and Meng in matches taped for WCW Pro. As part of the festivities, the future Hall of Famer also took a chokeslam on the floor from the Giant, aka The Big Show. As Edge tells it in his autobiography, he made the trip solely for the money and not career advancement as he yeah. knew that WWE was always the end goal. He also stated that, even in the mid-90s, he got a bad vibe from the backstage atmosphere and felt like the inmates were running the asylum. Even in his early 20s he knew that shit was wild in WCW. Good for him! Good for him! In the end, the whole experience only strengthened his resolve to make it to McMahon land. Number five, Robbie V. In Ooh. Oh, Rob Van Dam. Yeah, Imagine yeah, yeah. Rob Van Dam. 
Now imagine Rob Van Dam without the stubble, the cool airbrushed singlet, the chair-based offense, or the thumb pointing. That's the Rob Van Dam, or Robbie V, I should say, who tried his luck in WCW in the early 90s. Recruited by Booker Cowboy Bill Watts, Robbie V was poised for a bit of a push and initially won his matches on TV, beating the likes of Scotty Flamingo, Pat Rose, and Shanghai Pierce. All right, I did say a bit of a push, didn't I? I didn't say he was going to be the new Ricky Steamboat or anything. However, the whole flip in show had a tour booked with All Japan, and when he came... That magnificent porn stash. 70s porn stash on this referee. Look at it. Look at it! Back from it, Watts had been replaced by Ole Anderson, who wasn't so hot on this Robbie V character. Knowing he could make $2,000 per week in the Far East, as opposed to the $100 a match he was getting in WCW, Van Damme did what was best for his career and left to focus his efforts on All Japan instead. He would re-emerge for ECW a few years later and get over in a big way, after which the new WCW regime, headed up by Eric Bischoff, desperately wanted him back. Number 4. Dave Heath Prior to Gangrel. achieving attitude era infamy as the vampire Gangrel, Dave Heath worked all over the place, from Stu Hart's Stampede to All Japan and even ECW. While trying to get the attention of the American majors, Heath worked as an enhancement talent for both WWE and WCW dating back to the late 80s. In 89, he worked a handful of random WCW tag matches with various partners, then came back in 93 as a member of the Blackhearts. Heath was offered a full-time contract not too long after that, but turned it down because the coaches at the company's power plant training facility had called him fat. <coughs> Those blood-sucking creatures of the night. Yeah. Even in WWE, he was supposed to be the main star in The Brood, but he was too big, and Edge and Christian became the stars on that. And The Brood was meant to get him over. <sighs> Gangrel. I love Gangrel, but... Yeah, those weight issues. I are all sensitive souls deep down inside. Him fat. Those blood sucking creatures of the night are all sensitive souls deep down inside. He actually attempted to get back into WCW later, but the promotion wouldn't bite. Unlike Heath, because he's a vampire, innit? Instead, they had him do yet more jobs on low priority shows like Pro and Worldwide almost a decade after Heath had first done WCW job duty. Almost a year after putting over Rey Mysterio, Chris Jericho, Dean Malenko, and The Public Enemy, Heath showed up on WWE television in what oh, would become his most famous guys. Number three, Kip Montana. Billy Gunn? That sounds like Billy Gunn. Billy Gunn seemed yeah, to show Billy up from nowhere during WWE's New Generation era as a member of the Smoking Guns tag team alongside kayfabe brother Bart. And while it's true that Gunn wasn't a well-traveled veteran or some hot name on the indies, nor was he poached from another company, he did have some experience, including a short stint as an enhancement talent in WCW. Kipsop was making towns as a professional bull rider when he thought, hmm, what could be even worse for my body than this, and decided to swap the rodeo arena for a wrestling ring. He had the most rodeo cowboy name you could imagine initially, of course, going by Kip Montana, as he faced some heavy hitters in the form of Sting and the Road Warriors on WCW. Oh Pro shit, he got murdered. Everyone watching back then must have known that Sting and Kip Montana would still be going strong on TBS over 30 years later. Gunn was still very new to the business at the time and didn't do anything to really stand out, though his size and athleticism would help open the WWE door a few years later. Number two, Mr. JL. Jerry Lynn, Lynn was already seven and a half. Oh, Jerry Lynn, I love this guy. Come on, Mr. Fucking JL in a mask. Who would that be? Who would Mr. JL be? He wrestles like Jerry Lynn. He kind of looks like Jerry Lynn, except his face is hidden. Half years into his pro wrestling journey, when he signed for WCW in the fall of 1995. Lynn had been something of a sensation on the indies, having wrestled some standout matches with, in particular, Sean Lightning Kid Waltman, as well as doing tours of Japan and Mexico. Even though he had a reputation as a worker, WCW wanted to bring him in wearing a mask and outfit similar to the very popular Power Rangers as a member of the Cruiserweight division. Oh, yeah. Creatively renamed Mr. JL. Gee, how did they come up? Very creative name. Mr. JL. Hey, Jerry Lynn, we gotta make you wear a mask. Think of a new name. Oh, we'll think it for you. Mr. JL, go out there. Fuck. 
up with that. Lynn wrestled a wide variety of opponents on Nitro, Saturday Night, Pro, and Worldwide. He's got a bicycle. On the losing side of things and couldn't really get any momentum going due to injuries. Though his uh, pay per view is one and only pay per view. One of his only pay per view matches with Sabu was great. He Wrestled like ECW style, but it was on a WCW pay-per-view. He was let go while convalescing in the summer of 97, and after having a couple of tryouts with WWE, he wound up in ECW. It was alongside Paul Heyman's merry band of misfits that Jerry would truly solidify his legacy, having umpteen classic matches, as well as winning the promotion's heavyweight title. Number one, Terry Richards. Rhino! Rhino! One of the great successes of latter-day ECW was the rise of Rhino. The last ECW champion before Paul Heyman's promotion bit the dust, oh. the Man Beast was a- I'm sorry, I can't, I gotta stop doing that. He'll kick my ass. But Rhino! <laughs> I love Rhino, but Jesus Christ. Go for it! <laughs> Sorry! No more, no more. <laughs> Forced to be reckoned with in Philadelphia and looked like a genuine top level guy as he gored his way through the roster. It wasn't always that way, mind, and just a few years beforehand, he was one of the many bone benders hoping to catch the eye of either WWE or WCW. He had worked a series of televised matches for both organizations as plain old Terry Richards, but did more of them for WCW and got in there with some big stars too, like Road Warrior Hawk, Jim Duggan, the Nasty Boys, and. Um, the Renegade. Oh. Hilariously, oh. Rhino's own prevailing memory from this time was being backstage at the 1995 Great American Bash pay-per-view and looking on in horror as his childhood hero, Hulk Hogan, drank not one, but several ice-cold beers. <laughs> well, let me tell you something, brother. If you think that's the worst thing the Hulkster is capable of, I've got some sad news that's going to run wild on you. Uh, Brooke, are you dating a black man? You know, we don't do that here in this house. And Nick. Your Should I do the Nick joke? Brother, you know, Nick made a. <laughs> I can't. Oh, he potatoed his best friend. Uh, yeah, Hulk Hogan is a piece of shit. <laughs> Telling Nick in jail is like, oh, God. Made him go into the wheelchair. Fuck you, Hogan. <laughs> right away, great video by Cultaholic Wrestling. Always have some great videos. Uh, imagine a different timeline where these guys stayed and what would have happened. Would have they become big, bigger stars like they were in WWF? Who knows? But that's a different timeline. Anyway, that's it for now. Humanoid Nation. Humanoid out. Bye. Pasito a pasito, suave suavecito, nos vamos pegando.